Now, by now, I am sure that everyone here has heard how much passion I have about icons and that I'm leading the Canterbury Club through the process of writing an icon of Jesus. Now, I say the word leading because I really am not qualified to teach anyone this very detailed, focused technique. But I will say that I'm excited about the results, which you're going to get to see next week when we bless these icons on the altar. And they really are pretty darn amazing. And they are certainly the results of lots of hard work, lots of prayer, and the guiding hand of the Holy Spirit. I fell in love with icons about 10 years ago when I was teaching humanities. And when I first encountered this particular style of art, I thought they were one dimensional and not very lifelike at all. And they even seemed at times out of proportion and even a bit contrived. That is until I learned the beauty and the meaning of the technique. You see, an iconographer does not try to represent a person as he or she appears in life, but they are represented as a sacred pair, a sacred prayer, as the iconographer's hand is guided by God. Each stroke of that brush is like a form of meditation. And each subject is a sacred geometric composition with the intention of conveying the, safe, the saints with the light of the Holy Spirit that is emanating within them. Lynette Martin, in her book, Sacred Doorways, a beginning guide to icons, writes that during the Middle Ages, people believed that things could be transformed into other things. They grounded their belief in the transformation of the Eucharist, where the bread and the wine became the body and blood of Christ. And when artists create an icon, then they do something very similar and just as sacramental. Their work reveals the unseen face of God. While there are many steps to the process, the main one is the idea that the light of Christ should always shine through every image that is written. The aspiration to make light radiant and luminous using basic colors of brown and blue and red and yellow and even some white is certainly a challenge. But this is what made me fall in love with icons and with the creative process. We start with the darkest of colors. And you can see here in my beginning steps of the Holy Family, this dark brown that covers all. And then as we continue, we add a transparent, transparent layer upon layer, moving toward the light because the light radiates from within as shown in this icon of the transfiguration, not mine, as you can tell. An iconographer must learn how different colors are layered and allow for the transparency of each different underlying color to show through each other. For the Hebrews, darkness evokes everything that is anti-God and therefore light reflects the presence of God overcoming the darkness. Using light to reflect the presence of God is throughout scripture, starting with the very book of the very first book of the Bible. In Genesis, God spoke and light came into being. And in John, Jesus declares that he is the light of the world. He is the incarnate word of God who has come as the light that enlightens all people so that those believing in him <clears throat> will no longer be in darkness. And in Job, in the Psalms, Isaiah, and in Matthew, salvation is said to bring light to those in darkness. And then, of course, as Reverend Jim said, we read, we read this morning of the shining radiance of the transfigured Jesus. A final revelation on this last Sunday of Epiphany as we transition into Lent. Remember that Epiphany begins with the baptism of our Lord and the voice of God calling down to Jesus and all who were there present at his baptism. And he says, you are my beloved. In you, I am well pleased. Jesus goes through Epiphany, finding out, discovering who he is. The disciples go through with him, finding out what it means then 
to follow him. And the world watches, trying to discover what it means to have a Messiah. And so we began this season with God announcing to Jesus, you are my son. And we transitioned to Lent with God telling the world, this is my son, listen to him. These words tell us then of Jesus's primary job is to be a proclaimer of the word, of the message that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so here we have another mountaintop experience. Jesus takes his three trusted disciples, Peter, James, and John, with him to a place where the earth meets the sky, one of those thin places where God's voice is easily discerned. And Jesus becomes transfigured, filled with the glory and the light of God. And then the disciples, they see Jesus talking with Moses and Elijah, who we just heard about in our Old Testament reading this morning, two great prophets who carried the message of God to the people and who are now turning to the fulfillment of the very words they shared and that they taught, that Jesus, who is not a replacement of the Old Testament law and the prophets, but a fulfillment of them. And so the prophetic voice continues. And you know, of the three disciples, you know which one's going to speak up first. Of course, it's Peter. And even though he has no idea what to say, as he has just been in this great presence of God's light, the only thing he can come up with is, let's build some tents. But of course, anything that they could possibly muster would never be able to explain or to express what they had just seen. Anything they would say would be incomplete just as Jesus' story is not complete yet. Note that on their way back then down the mountain, Jesus tells them, as a matter of fact, demands or commands them to wait and to be silent and not to share what they have seen until after the resurrection. Note he didn't say after the crucifixion. He said after the resurrection so that they can then know and tell the entire story of salvation waiting you know while often it's very uncomfortable it is a very important part of faith while in discernment i wanted to control my own journey through that process imagine that my son would laugh and only to find out that every time i've tried to move things forward it was stymied at every turn and i'll tell you it taught me very quickly that waiting was a valuable part of transformation. Today and this week, we began our walk with Jesus to the cross. We began our waiting for the outcome that we already know is going to happen. Remember, I like to say we live in the isness of the was. And yet while we wait, we are given the opportunity to remember and to relive and to experience again what it means to walk with Christ towards Jerusalem. In our reading this morning from 2 Kings, to be like Elisha then, and to, who followed Elijah until the end, even though Elijah told him to go back. Three times he told him to go back, and three times he responds, I've been with you this far, and I will stay with you until the end. Now, I don't know if any of you read Richard Rohr's meditations or do read them, but go back and look at his February the 4th post, Lean Not on Your Own Understanding. And in that post, he cites a passage from Barbara Brown Taylor's book, Learning to Walk in the Dark. And in that book, she is quoting John of the Cross, who's a 16th century Spanish mystic. And so she says, or she explains that, John of the Cross says that the dark night is God's best gift to you, intended for your liberation. It is about freeing you from your ideas about God, your fears about God, your attachment to all the benefits that you have been promised for believing in God, your devotion to the spiritual practices that are supposed to make you feel closer to God, your dedication to doing and believing all the right things about God, your positive and negative evaluations of yourself as a believer in God, and your tactics for manipulating God and your sure cures 
or doubting God. All of these then are just substitutes for God, John says. And really they all just get in God's way. So I want you to think about that, those words as we prepare for Lent and as we open up ourselves again, again to the story. Let us shed all of the preconceived notions and practices and hear the story as if for the first time so that we can deeply understand what it means to walk to the cross and to experience the true darkness of the loss of light, to sit in that darkness waiting for our own transformation. Amen. Amen.